Um, good evening. Okay, I'd like to convene the Administra Evanston's Administration Public Works Committee of Monday, November 14th. Uh, Mr. Stonebeck, if you'd like to take roll. Council Member Newsma. Here. Council Member Burns. Here. Council Member Reed. Here. Council Member Kelly. Here. Council Member Harris. Present. There's a quorum, ma'am. Great. Um, next, I'd like to um, approval of minutes. Is there somebody who'd like to move approval of the minutes? I'll move approval of the minutes from our last meeting. I will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. You didn't ask for any changes. Any? You didn't ask for any changes. Any, any, we probably didn't have any, but I'm just saying as a matter of procedure. To open it up for discussion, any changes? I don't think we have any. But any changes? Yeah. No. Okay, Not, nobody opposed? All right, uh, minutes are approved. Um, we'll now move to public comment. Uh, we have Richard Gilbert and Bob Fisher, and then uh, Tim Schoolmaster. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Bob Fisher, and I'm the owner of Evanston Lumber, and my general manager. I'm Richard Gilbert, general manager of Evanston Lumber. First, thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity to speak to you. What we're here to talk about tonight is what we feel is a fairly simplistic issue that we're having with respect to truck traffic rolling down Main Street, trying to deliver material into Evanston Lumber via Custer. So, Richard, you want to elaborate? So the issue is, uh, there are actually a couple issues. First of all, and most importantly, it's a safety issue. Um, the turn at uh, Main Street onto Custer for these uh, semi-trucks that are sometimes in length of 53 feet is a very difficult turn to navigate. And on top of that, um, there's a post office right there on the corner, so people are parking in front of the post office continually, illegally. Um, so there have been a number of accidents at that corner for cars that are parked there as these trucks try to make that turn. And it's also very unsafe for pedestrian traffic crossing that crosswalk at Main and Custer. Um, that's the most important thing. Uh, obviously is the safety of your constituents here in Evanston and any other shoppers that are coming into the neighborhood you know that's what we're most concerned about obviously the, the other part of this is that we were told that there's a uh, Main Street project going to be happening within the next uh, year or two that is going to shrink the size of Main Street even further which will make it virtually impossible for the semi trucks to make that turn at, at Main Street onto Custer. So the proposed, uh, what was proposed to us was being able to have these trucks come down Oakton Street to Custer and at that intersection, it's a four-way stop sign, it's a fairly large intersection with much less traffic than at Main Street and an easier turn for these trucks to make and then have a straight shot in coming into Custer. Okay, thank you very much. And would you like to speak also? Well, obviously, truck traffic is vital to keeping our business open. We have everything delivered to the lumberyard on the backs of these semis. So, you know, this is cru crucial for our operation of our company. We, obviously, we've been in business at that location since 1948. So we want to continue staying in Evanston and operating, and we're just trying to alleviate that really difficult turn, dangerous turn, which for years we've kind of watched and witnessed a few of our, the semis delivering to us getting in accidents at that corner. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure, of course. Next is uh, Tim Schoolmaster, followed by Mike Vasilko. Um, 
Would you like to present at the end of public comment? I've asked for um, this personal privilege, a little bit of a longer presentation. Mike Vasilko followed by Rodney Green. I shop at Evanston Lumber. Keep these guys in business, please. They're great. Um, okay, APW, item A3. So I understand you can't buy an electric truck for $250,000 or you don't want to wait for it, but that truck will be in existence probably for 20, 30 years. Burning gas. Playground equipment, A4 for $34,000. Is this an urgent item or could this not be postponed? Uh, I don't recall any resolutions regarding uh, emergency playground equipment. A7, 25 to 30,000 to have some, hire somebody to assist with reimagining public safety. Why do we need an assistant to reimagine public safety? I thought that conversation was nearly over and we should save that money. A49, a, a $43,500 change order um, to make a new total contract of $376,000 uh, for the consultant who's doing the big rock solutions to the lakefront protection. I saw the presentation <clears throat> at the library a week or so ago, nothing but big boulders. Imagine uh, Northwestern's edge all the way up and down the lakefront. That's what I saw, very unimaginative. And I don't think that should be for action. A10, $60,000 for plan review by SafeBuilt, who are out of Colorado. So their new contract is $160,000. So first of all, why the, why the uptick? And um, why is it not a local firm? There are thousands of architectural firms and engineering firms in our area that could do this very same thing. A lot closer, could do inspections actually without traveling on a plane. So I question why we have to do that. And you know, we can't have an APW meeting without talking about why residents shouldn't pay more than $15,000 to repair their public sewer. That's APW item A11. Please pass this once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vasilko. Rodney Green followed by Dave Ellie. I'm saying it right. Yeah, I don't see Mr. Green, so uh, Dave Ellie. My name's Dave Ellis, and uh, I'm going to speak to the pension funding issue, so I'll defer to when we get to that topic. Sorry, it's not an actual topic, so... Oh, I can speak to pension. My name's Dave Ellis. Great to be here and talking with you guys about pension funding. I've been uh, talking about this for uh, since probably 1981. I've seen all the iterations, combinations, and cajoling going on with pension funding in the city. Um, since then, I'm a retired fireman. I was a fireman paramedic for Evanston for 34 years, born and raised in Evanston, went to all the school systems here, raised my family here, still live here in the seventh ward. Pension funding is uh, going to continue to be the largest burden to taxpayers that they'll ever see. The councils in the past have directed corp uh, corp legal corporate counsel to bankrupt the pension system in the 70s and 80s. There was zero funding put in, dollars put in it during that time. Jack Siegel, former uh, corporate uh, counsel in, uh, under Julia Carroll's tenure, did uh, address the city council in an open meeting and say that's what their, the plan was. That got taken to court and that didn't work. So we've been behind the eight ball with pension funding for decades. This is going to come home to roost for the taxpayers. If we don't fund the pensions now with a decisive budget action long term at 100%, the taxpayers are going to take a tremendous beating 
Pension funding is only funded through property taxes. That's it. The mechanism is in place to do it. It's a contractual obligation the city has with the pension funds. There's no getting out of it. There's no bankrupting the pension funds. The city has assets that could come into play if that was, if that was going to be a thing. Uh, I think it uh, serves all citizens, all taxpayers, the bond service and everything that we do the, uh, financially the right thing, uh, funding pensions at 100 percent. I think the money is there. It's a matter of priorities. Um, and it's also a matter of the welfare and the health of, and of the economic stability of the city. Uh, I hope that uh, the council can look past uh, the, the past and look forward and, and get this thing funded appropriately and for once and for all. So it's not going to be an annual, semi-annual issue, different councils, different city managers, different histories, different revisions, and to be able to put this to bed and set the course on the right path. So that's what I have for right now. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Next is uh, Francine Allen. Hello again to everyone. I want to take one minute to thank the APW committee for your time, your work, your research, your robust discussions and dedication to helping Evanston residents. It was exactly two years ago um, today, the week before Thanksgiving, that my sewer system was declared failed. When I was informed it would cost $45,000 to regain sewer service, I contacted the city seeking help. I was informed other than a low interest loan that would require placing a lien on my property, there was no insistence. As I struggled to, uh, on my own to navigate through a very complex process to fix my sewer, I made it my personal mission to make sure no other Evanston resident would need to use life savings to pay for a functional toilet and sewer. As you look at the data provided on pages 13 and 14 of today's um, packet, from the years 2016 through 2022, my $45,000 repair was by far the most expensive. My situation revealed not all sewer, sewer repairs are created equal. Thankfully, here we are today with a reasonable and equitable resolution for homeowners. Evanston is known for its commitment to equality, equity and equality. By passing this resolution, APW helps make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that's the last in person. Uh, then Angela Anderson. I don't, I'm not sure if she, and then Suzanne Doxtor, Doxtor. Hi, this is Susan Doxtator. Um, I was, um, let me get my camera set up. There we go. Uh, I wanted to comment publicly on, let me get the resolution up. Resolution 119R22, authorizing city staff to issue a memorandum to the Evanston Police Department Traffic Enforcement with a notification regarding incoming delivery trucks to Evanston Lumber. Um, I find it really concerning that this is on, is up for discussion, um, well, better discussion than decision. Um, Oakton Street has I live in Ninth Ward, and I see how backed up Oakton gets frequently during the week. Um, it's a, a thoroughfare that three schools are on, Oakton Elementary, Shute Middle School, and Dawes Elementary. Um, and there are some parts near McCormick Place where, or McCormick um, Place where it's very wide, but generally, um, it's not a wide street. There were traffic calming measures in, um, implemented to make it narrow, narrower in spots. Um, and this street is also used for access to South Boulevard and Lakeshore, which then leads you onto Lakeshore Drive eventually, you know, Sheridan Road to Lakeshore Drive. It has access to major hospital with an emergency room. Um, and there's just... <laughs> a lot of foot traffic during the time of day on weekdays when may these if this resolution were passed that these trucks would be the semi trucks would be passing through the neighborhood um and so i would like to i would like for your committee to uh not recommend this re resolution um i understand there are difficulties with the main and custer intersection but i don't think the answer is to route semi trucks 
through um, down Emerson, down Oakton Street and up Custer Avenue to Evanston Lumber. Thank you very much. Doug Sharp. Yeah, thank you for uh, taking my public comment request. Uh, my name is Doug Sharp. I am a resident of the Ninth Ward and live on Cleveland Street west of Dodge and just a few blocks north of Oakton. I'm speaking in opposition to item D1 resolution 119R22, which would allow for the large delivery trucks heading for Evanston Lumber to reroute them from Main Street to Oakton. I have several reasons for opposing this resolution. Oakton Street already has a serious truck and traffic problem. It is a very busy thoroughfare for traffic entering and leaving Evanston, including large trucks heading to Orange Crush, Ozinga, North Shore Towing, Evanston Organics, and numerous auto repair shops. Oakton is the primary crossing point for pedestrian traffic. Children and parents heading to or leaving from Oakland Elementary School, Shute Middle School, and Dawes Elementary School. Oakton is also the crossing point for people heading to and from James Park, as well as shoppers on foot crossing Oakton who are heading to or from numerous retail outlets, such as Aldi, Home Depot, Food for Less, and Sam's Club. And while I have concerns for the negative impacts of this proposal along the entire length of Oakton on which these trucks would travel, I have even greater concern for the western end of Oakton, west of Dodge, where I live, and which is adjacent to much of the industrial and commercially zoned land in Evanston. We are a neighborhood already impacted negatively by the businesses immediately to our west, as our council member Juan Hedicatis can attest. This resolution will only add to that impact. The city has already invested $139,000 on an engineering study that will hopefully address the existing traffic congestion and pedestrian safety issues on Oakton. The city plans to implement this project next summer. It clearly does not make sense for the city to spend these resources to solve the current truck problem and then turn around and add more tra truck traffic to the street. In summary, the city should not ignore the risks and negative impacts of this resolution, which would affect hundreds of Evanston households along the length of Oakton, simply to accommodate a single business. Thank you. Thank you. In addition to that, uh, the city clerk has forwarded uh, 10 emails uh, from community members uh, indicating their opposition to that resolution as well. I don't think that there's anybody else here for public comment. And uh, Mr. Schoolmaster. So I've asked, um, as I feel it's of extreme importance that council members and the public um, be aware of our public safety pension and our public, pen, public safety pension liability and where we stand today to be informed when we make decisions about our budget. Um, I've asked Mr. St Schoolmaster to give us a short presentation um, so that we have a better understanding um, about where the city stands to date and, and, and what sort of decision we should make in terms of funding um, our Evanston Police and Fire Pension. Thank you. Alderman, thank you very much. Uh, Alderman, or Council Member Kelly, it's, it's hard for me to change that. I remember back there, there were 18 uh, alder persons up here, and uh, that was reduced. Uh, the, the staff has, uh, and if this needs to be tied to a budget item, A1, uh, payrolls, my members, fire members, make contributions to this fund every two weeks. And now we're talking about the city, the potential city contribution. And I noted that there were a number of new uh, council members this year, and um, I thank you for stepping up. But some of this must be bewildering. You must be asking yourself, what was I thinking when I did this? But thank you for serving. Um, we have had a presentation from our actuary, Jason Franken of Foster and Foster, and Jason can talk for three days at a time about stuff only he understands. 
Uh, I wanted to make something a little bit simpler so that we, we can make sure we understand and that the taxpayers understand what's really going on here. So without further ado, uh, Evanston, uh, as you may know, has had police officers since 1863. We, the police pension fund was created in 1911 and we've paid benefits uh, without interruption since then. Evanston utilized volunteer firefighters from 1875 to about 1883, and the Fireman's Pension Fund was chartered uh, two years after ours was. Pension funds pay retirement, death, and disability f uh, benefits. The members are not in Social Security, and those that are from secondary or post-retirement uh, employment may have a lot of their contributions confiscated. Uh, it was difficult for me to pay Evanston property taxes all that life on my police officer and police sergeant salary. I moonlighted as a, a senior lecturer at a, a nearby private university for 34 years, and I paid into Social Security fully. But over 60% of that is confiscated, even though I've paid into that. So we are not in Social Security. And the contributions are both the employer and the employee go to pay for public safety services already rendered, none are for future services, which means if you completely eliminated the police or fire departments tomorrow, these would still have to be administered and funded for the next 80 to 100 years. Uh, the, the funds are bodies politic. They're separate and distinct from the city. They're created by the Illinois legislature. They're funded by a, a city property tax. They hold funds and trust for the members of the fund, both active and retired, and they are governed by a separate board of trustees. By statute, the Evanston Finance Director, the CFO, is the treasurer of each fund, but he cannot move money or do anything without direction from the board. So what are these? Well, they're defined benefit plans. They are a deferred piece of salary. It's a promise to pay later for work that's being done now. It's a contractual obligation of employment. It's funded by both the employer and the employee, and uh, there are certainly a certain tax advantages to both. It also has insurance aspects. It plays uh, death benefits and payments to workers who become disabled. And it helps attract and retain experienced and highly trained personnel in positions critical to the continuous and reliable delivery of vital public services. You want police officers who have 20 years experience and 25 years, and firefighters as well. You don't want them switching every two years. The bulk of the benefit funding, in theory, is not shouldered by the taxpayers. Uh, the Illinois Constitution uh, said the uh, contractual relationship shall not be diminished or unimpaired, and there were attempts to reduce or take away uh, pension benefits and those were unanimously rejected by the Illinois Supreme Court in 2015. So if you're a taxpayer, and all aldermen are taxpayers, these are a part of employment. They're funded through the tax levy, employee contributions, and investment return. Paying the benefits is not something that you get to choose to do or not. You have to do them. And a good policy in any employee-driven operation is to pay your employees first. I've worked for the city long enough. I saw the traffic studies and uh, we had uh, we paid a lot of money for a gang study. We wanted the study to say we didn't have a gang problem and back in the 80s we went to sleep and it came up and bit us big time. So I'm aware that there are multiple things that have to be paid for in city government but number one should be you pay your employees. Now, uh, there's a little bit of math involved with this, and I, uh, th this was me before I started uh, any of this stuff. I didn't understand this any better than anybody else. Um, forget, forget the equation out there, I'll get to that. But the plan design, the important thing here is that 60 to 70% of the benefits are supposed to be paid by investment income. Uh, here's w what that equation is over on the right side of the equal sign. We got the benefits, we can project those. We have the expenses, we can project those. So the variables on the left side are the investment return and the contributions. The employees are fixed. They don't have a choice of what they put in. The employer or the tax levy, that's the one that, so everything on the left has to equal everything on the right, but 
the heavy lifting is supposed to be done by investment income. Uh, we had gotten off track, and in 2007, Julia Carroll was city manager, and she had been a finance director before, and I went to Liz Tisdall, who was my alderman then, and Ann Rainey also jumped on it, and we started to get back on track. Here is the 2009 required payment. Now, there should be no red in there. It should all be blue, and if the thing was fully funded, you can see for police, it would be less than $2 million. But you can see there's a big other payment because money wasn't put in and the heavy lifting is not being done by investment return. It's being done by the taxpayers. That's what hurts. The following year, you can see the levy went up about a million dollars. The percentages stayed about the same. Let's skip to 2020. Percentages are pretty close, but the levy's gone up. And 2021, and we're always a year behind, so we're looking at the 2021 numbers. Uh, we can see they're about 34.65. Fire's got the same situation. Pretty much stays the same. Uh, here's last year, um, about 30.70. This is both funds combined. So the total levy this year as recommended by your actuary, but this is not what's on the uh, levy that you're supposed to. Your actuary says you need 22 million 039 820, and only 7 million of that is for the benefits. I will send all of you this presentation later so you can uh, do whatever. The scary part is that $14 million part, the interest payments. So the taxpayer takeaway here is that the bulk of the investment returns will be paid by the investment return, but that assumes proper contributions, which did not happen on a regular basis, and investment and compound interest do the heavy lifting. Evanston didn't go to the legislature. You kind of redesigned the plan so that the bulk of the benefits are paid by the taxpayers, and that should make you very angry. Made me very angry. So how did we get there? Well, this is the police fund alone. You can see from 1972, you can see uh, we're at 4 million, and then we kind of snaked our way in 2010 to 88 million. Prior to 2013, when the GASB, Government Accounting Standards Board, who sets the rules on this stuff, point, that point was of, just kind point of, of information. Point. It wasn't really there. Point of information. I'm just curious if these numbers are adjusted for inflation, I'm not seeing that. Uh, no, these were the these are the numbers that the actuaries every year calculate. Whoever was the actuary then, this is what they calculated. Correct. I'm just wondering if it's adjusted for inflation. Um, yeah, they, yeah, they do. No, that. I mean, okay. They do that every year. I'm just saying. I'm what I'm saying is, I know those are the actual numbers, but I'm. It's not adjusted for inflation, which may not be as helpful, is, is all I'm saying. Correct. That was the Department right. of Insurance. Which? In 2006, it turned out that Windsor, who was a friend of, uh, a friend of uh, uh, Bill Stafford, who had never done evaluation in Illinois, we found out later was not qualified to do evaluation in Illinois. He was doing it anyway. Uh, Gabriel Roder Smith in 07 and 10, and then in, after 2013, you actually have to show the debt on your balance sheet. You can't just show it as a footnote. So this is the, uh, the last two years of the total unfunded, and you can see police went down. That's very unusual, but we had three bang-up years of investment return. We won't see those again. Fire went up a little. Uh, this 90% funding I'll talk about in a minute. You can see uh, we got these numbers: uh, 240 million and 235 million. So under the current statute, it has to be funded 90% by 2040. So let's include the 10%, which is not shown. That jumps for this year to 280 million. Now the total bonded debt of the city right now is about 200 million. That's it. But you've also got this other thing here that's not a bond, but it has to be paid. So I guess the question, if you're a taxpayer, do you want to pay down $280 million by 2040? 
Or would you prefer to pay 500 million? Or would you prefer to pay 750 million? Because these are all possibilities if it's not paid down in big chunks. So the magic of compound interest, which goes both ways, you have to have money to, to make money. It pays you on the money and also on the interest. But if you have debt, it only goes in the other direction. You pay it. Albert Einstein allegedly called it the eighth wonder of the world. Now, every month, if you have a credit card, you probably look at something like this. Here's your current balance, $510. How many picked that little box there? Uh, how many picked the uh, statement balance? And how many picked the minimum payment due? Well, for 40 years, the city has selected either the statement balance or the minimum payment due. That's the scary part. So there's some funding mythology uh, that the uh, Municipal League has uh, done back to the 1990s. Uh, hooray for the city, they've rejected the funding method, the projected unit credit. Instead of entry age normal, the city's using entry age normal. And then there's this 90% funding myth. And here's what the myth is and that you don't want to do it. Bottom line is when you get your accrued liability, your unfunded here is 132 million. So 10% of that, the 26 million, is ignored for the next 20 years. That, that 26 million is only good today. As the fund gets bigger, the 26 million gets bigger. The interest gets bigger, and you're paying interest on that all the way along. So you could be paying as much as 87 million or 100 million or more just we fully paid the whole the mortgage, but we still owe $100 million. That's a scary prospect. This is the entry age normal, but you, the, what the state would like you to do is gives you lower payments in the beginning and you get much higher ones later. This happened back in 93. You see that straight line, see those bars, the, the straight line bars down there? That's the old funding method. It was supposed to be done by 2010. Instead, the uh, Municipal League helped this thing where we would reduce the payments for about the first 12 years, and then you were guaranteed to have at least 350 times more debt at the end, which is coming up pretty soon. So there's some warning shots about this. Moody's, Fitch, red flag warnings. Bob Seidenberg has been writing about this stuff since 1982, I think. He was 10 years old then. Um, every time they say this burden remains large, despite annual contributions that exceed both the actuarial uh, requirements. Here's one in 2017. Here's one in um, 2018. Uh, here's one that I found on a public source, and this this one kind of scared me. Look at the non-compliance of. The Securities and Exchange Commission sued the state of New Jersey in 2010 for fraudulent municipal bond offerings. In 2013, they sued the state of Illinois for the same thing. Uh, time after time, Illinois failed to inform its bond investors about the risk to the financial condition posed by structural underfunding of the pension system. Doesn't that kind of look like what's been going on here? I hope they don't take a hard look at this. Uh, San Diego, they went after them. Harrisburg, PA, Harvey, Illinois. Um, this is something that you probably don't want to do, and if you have been doing it, you want to fix it in a hurry. 
Okay, so let's look at some of the, besides police and fire pensions, IMRF. Evanston was a founding member in 1939, and somebody had the genius to require when IMRF points to you and say that the contribution this year is $100 million, there's no argument, you do it. Social Security, same deal. You don't quibble one dollar with those. Why do we keep structurally and perpetually underfunding police and fire funds? Your personal safety and well-being is constantly protected by 229 sworn professionals, 127 police officers. That's down from 166 at the end of 2018, 102 firefighter paramedics. When this building was empty, when this building was a ghost town, those 229 came to work every day, and they would show up at your house or wherever they were needed because that's their job. They still make house calls. There is a game that we've been playing in the city. I uh, 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 sort of shame Marty Lyons into hiring Foster and Foster as actuaries in 2016. And one of his first uh, studies says we're going to use six and a quarter investment return. Well, that first year there was a double whammy. There was, uh, there was also a mortality change. So he said, this is a double hit. And we said, okay, yeah, we agree. We'll, we'll go with six and a half. That saves you about a million and a half dollars. But going forward, they all said, sure, we'll go to six and a quarter. Well, it's never happened. We play this six and a half percent game. And that now has shortchanged police and fire funds about eight to $10 million since 2017. Uh, there may be a plan to uh, collect that. We had a real rosy investment the end of 2021. Our investment gain for three years was just a hair under $70 million. If we had been fully funded, it would have been $145 million. In 2019, we had a 22% investment return, but a negative cash flow ratio, and I'll talk about consolidation in just a minute. Pension obligation bonds, these are not for the faint of heart. POBs, but what did these folk know that we don't know? Look at this, Quincy Mass, 475 million pension obligation bond. Brockton Mass, 300 million. These are similar communities, smaller ones, Moline and Wheaton, Skokie, 176 million. So what they were doing is converting soft debt into hard debt. Two, three years ago, you could have borrowed the whole, our 280 million, you could have borrowed that for 2%. Do you want to pay for the next 20 years at 2% or would you like to pay at 6.5%? Unfortunately, that train has left the station. I don't expect to see that again. Darren Darty uh, uh, couldn't be here tonight and Jack Mortel will be if you have any questions from Fire Pension. Uh, one other thing we're doing to try and lower the burden on the taxpayers. This was filed one day before it expired, Evanston Police Pension Fund versus the McKesson Corporation, one of the biggest pharmaceutical distributors. We accused them of securities fraud and price fixing. They spent a lot of money on getting this thrown out of court. A couple weeks ago, they have agreed to pay $141 million to the, the shareholders. Now, how much we'll get to that, I don't know. I know the lawyers will get a big chunk of this because that's how they make their living. But even if we make $10, we've saved the taxpayers $10 on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Schoolmaster. Okay, uh, go ahead, Councilor yeah, one, one question, Mr. Schoolmaster. Um, do you know the last time the city had a finance and budget committee, if, if it ever did? I think it's pretty new. Um, I think, um, you know, if you had questions and stuff, it would go to the, the CFO and uh, they, would, they would crank out whatever you ask for. So I, I, I think this is a really good move because I've, I've watched a couple of the meetings and, and you get, there's some really smart people who really do money on that, on that uh, committee. So. No, I agree, and I, and, and I appreciate your presentation. I think it was particularly helpful for the general public that, that may not attend the Finance and Budget Committee meetings and follow our discussion around this. I think this body, though, is, is very clear on what we need to do 
and and have no interest in, in in passing this along. I think we're we're prepared to do what's necessary. Um, but I also just wanted to use this as an opportunity to plug the finance and budget committee because that was that was created under this administration. I asked Mr. Schoolmaster because clearly he's been uh, following the council since there was double double us up here, which was was quite a while ago. And um, but I think that was a huge uh, step in the right direction. Um, as you said, you you have to send e you would send emails to you know, the CFO or assistant CFO, or, you know, you would try to bring it up during actually this committee meeting, APW, which it's tough to get in the weeds during this committee because we're also trying to pay bills and pay contractors. And so I think we were very intentional about creating this 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 new space separate from any other standing committee meetings and council meetings to bring in the experts, as you mentioned, um, to, 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 to propose recommendations for this council, one being, as I think folks may have seen in the, in the news, to, to tackle uh, our pension obligation this year and increase that contribution. So I just want to thank you for your time. But no, also thank you for your support. As an opportunity that. to bring up the Finance and Budget Committee. So if you want to follow, you, now you have an opportunity, and by you, all of us have an opportunity now to think about our budget and our finances year-round through the Finance and Budget Committee. And so it's my you. understanding that they recommended the six and a quarter uh, uh, actuarial and full funding, not the 90%, but the full funding. And there's money somewhere around there. It's not my job to find the money, but it, as you know, there, there's money floating around. Thank you so much for your comment. Thank you very much. And thank you, Councilmember Burns. And the, at the last Finance and Budget Committee meeting, we did, for all those present at the meeting, we did uh, unanimously agree that we wanted to recommend fully funding our police and fire public safety pension. Yes, if I okay. may call for the order of the day. Uh, I move uh, the consent agenda, the consent calendar. Would anybody like to remove any items first, right? Presuming no one does. Um, I would like to pull a three, um, a seven, and a nine and a ten. I'll keep it brief. Okay. I move the consent agenda minus a three, a seven, a nine, and a ten. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. That consent agenda is approved. Um, my items A3. Madam Chair, I'll move item A3, authorizing the purchase of a new 2024 Mack truck for Workforce Development Program and Public Works Agency. Second. Thank you. Um, I just had a question, just if someone could respond regarding um, the question that was brought up about electric trucks and when those would be phased in to respond to the public comment. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Sean Cholik, Facilities and Fleet Management. Um, in regards to electric trucks, um, so there are some options that we have been exploring, uh, but we haven't found anything that, that is fitting yet for this purpose. Um, we are currently underway with the electrification and right sizing study, and we are hoping that um, that's gonna inform us on how to move forward and plan out for um, when, when these will be proven and ideal for uh, reliable operations and what kind of manufacturers we can look to for, for those. Um, but right now, this is um, this is kind of what we're finding is that there's there's nothing that's suitable for it at this point. Thank you. Do you have is there like a time frame when we might be able to expect? I I really can't give a time frame um, right now. Even with this this, I know we keep hearing this supply chain issues. Um, you know, right now, even this diesel version of the truck is anticipated to be here probably towards the end of 23 possibly even into 24 so it's really hard to pinpoint now uh, right now exactly when uh, when these will be ready for us okay thank you sure and I did have a question about biodiesel you answered it by email but just for the record if you could address that sure sure so you had asked about um, let me just refer to my notes here you had um, asked a question about biodiesel for uh, for vehicles in the fleet. 
So we, we currently have biodiesel, but we're starting to um, go through the process of phasing those out um, for several reasons. Um, one of those is that um, it's, what they're finding is that it's um, less stable and deteriorates over time, so it doesn't really um, last long. It could, you know, uh, start to deteriorate, you know, in, in the shipments that we're getting. It could start to deteriorate in our tanks because we're not utilizing it as much. Um, but that, that's what they're finding out there in our research. Um, we also have issues with it kind of gelling up in the low temperatures. We have additives that we put into the diesel fuel, but apparently we can't put them into the biodiesel. Um, and then the, the thing that we're most concerned about is we're finding evidence in our engines that it's uh, causing them to prematurely corrode a little bit and that it's gumming them up. And so we're looking to steer completely away from it and you know, look into other uh, renewable options. Sure. Okay, any other comments? Okay, um, so do we take roll? Just all in f okay. Um, Voice vote's fine. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, item um, A3 unanimously passes. Moving to item A7. So moved. Second. Okay, A7 moved by Councilmember Burns and seconded by Councilmember Reed. Um, I guess I would just like a little more of an understanding. You know, I feel like we do need um, coordination overall for our safety outreach um, and our, our social safety network. So I think Councilmember Burns, this is your, I think is this your referral? Yeah, um, so uh, similar to Finance and Budget Committee, we created the Reimagining and Public Safety Committee. Uh, Mr. Vasilko, I would um, invite you out to one of our committee meetings so that you can more closely understand the work that we've been doing for the past several months. Um, without going into the weeds, because this is really simple, I've said this over and over again, so apologize for being redundant, but there are things that the city has said we want to accomplish, some really big, big uh, uh, accomplishments that we want to undertake. You know, pensions is one, but we have other others as well. One of them is is CARP. We talk about a lot, a lot about uh, climate action and resi our climate action and resiliency plan, and moving towards our plan to implementation. We talk a lot about housing. We also talk about reimagining our public our approach to achieving public safety. Um, what I've seen in my short time here as uh, as as an elected official is that on these really big projects, we typically assign little to no staff support to advance the work. And this wouldn't be, you know, tolerated in any other organization. But but I've found that some for some reason in government, there's this sense that you can do everything through merely in, through a volunteer effort and through the support of a staff that, in my opinion, is already it, some of our staff are doing the job of two or three people as it stands, right? As we continue to have uh, uh, issues with covering vacant positions. And so to me, this is, without even getting to the weeds, it's just literally assigning the appropriate staff to advance work that we say is important to us, that we care about. And so this is what started off as um, a uh, working with an uh, organization called Fuse, has now gone to an, uh, an hourly contracted employee uh, that will work about 20 hours a week, and we would use them as needed to support the work of our Reimagining Public Safety Committee, and uh, that is what is before us this evening. Thank you, Councilmember Burns. Any other discussion? Yes. Uh, so who staffs this meeting currently? And I understand that. I would say maybe maybe Allison is, is there to support. In no, actually, uh, it was uh, Matthew Orn, who is the staff yeah. for the uh, overall I committee, but he, he's no longer. And, and Allison's involved, too, involved certainly. Too, yeah. um, but Matthew is kind of like the the admin for the committee, but he's no longer in that position. We don't, I don't think we have a new ICMA fellow yet. So it was an ICMA fellow who was staffing. Is there a new ICMA fellow on the way or fellows? Or There's a hope to hire one in 23, okay. but there is not now. And that's in the, but Allison has attended several of these meetings as well. And we're, we're budgeted for one ICMA fellow for next year, or do we have to budget that? That's, uh, we do budget for it, and it is included in city manager's budget. Okay. And understanding that staffing the meeting is different than 
doing the work. You That's know, what they do first. Meetings. So I don't have to say it correct. Yeah. yeah. Matthew was literally scheduling meetings, and I mean, that was really it. Um, and not to say he couldn't do more, but he had other assignments throughout the organization. So presumably, so if, you read the, if you read the scope of this, I mean, this is a lot more involved than that. Yeah. Right. So this person would, in addition to staff in the meeting, help execute those plans that right. were right. developed at you know, within that committee. Do it right. We're really doing the back end, the admin, you know, support. Mm -hmm. And so it's again, the scope of work is included, but but there's a lot of research that's needed, organizing the meetings, uh, taking minutes, you know, helping the chairs and whatever they, you know, we have three working groups. We have the Reimagining Public Safety Committee, but also three working groups that have their own tasks and, 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 and workload. And so I think one of the primary things they can do, at least initially, is to develop the work plan, help the chairs develop a work plan for each committee to, again, try to advance the work. But And we're proposing this as a short-term, one-year contract position? I think that's how we have it, Dave. If you can, was it, did we say 18 months or something, what did we say? Uh, it's tied to end, I believe, September 30th, 2023. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, if there aren't any other comments, um, all in favor of item A7? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, A7 passes. Um, moving to item A9, would someone like to move? Madam Chair, I'll move item A9, approval of change order number one with Smith Group for the Evanston Shoreline Repairs, which is RFQ 21-45, uh, and the dollar amount of 43520 Okay, item A9 has been moved by Council Member Newsman, seconded by Council Member Harris. Um, I guess I'm not, I wonder if staff could um, just explain a little bit more about this. I'm not really clear why at this point we would be the need to allocate this funding. Hi, my name is Laura Biggs. I'm the city engineer. Um, could you clarify your question? Uh, could you describe in what the 43,000, what this is for? I understand it's because when I met with the Lakefront group, the Smith group, and I know we're going to get a, um, a more in detail presentation this evening, um, it's still very, in terms of what their, their um, charges, what the public wants, it's all still being developed. So I'm not clear why we now need to allocate yet more funding when we're still developing, figuring out what the residents' interests are and where we want to go with what they've already, with the work they've done and the data that they've collected. This is related to the dog beach and reopening the dog beach. So at the time that we talked about reopening the dog beach and Director Stone, or I'm sorry, De Deputy Manager Stoneback gave a presentation about what would be required. Uh, the direction that staff received, to my understanding, was to reopen the dog beach promptly for a few weeks prior to the end of the season. And by next year, work towards um, doing the things that would make us legally compliant with both Cook County Health Code requirements and American with Disabilities Act. So the Smith Group work is related to the ADA, American with Disability Act improvements. And so what they would be doing for this, would be, they would be doing conceptual, they would be doing data collection and conceptual design on a ADA access that is legally compliant down to the dog beach. Thank you. So I do want to just take a moment to say how absolutely wonderful um, the dog beach has been. It's been a huge uplifting um, part of the year for so many residents and people come from outside of Evanston too. So kudos to staff for getting that up and running and actually building a beautiful um, ramp and a gate. So I guess my question is that we, you know, we're building an ADA ramp and I understand that we don't have engineers here who can design an ADA ramp, right? We don't we, have that. We do not employ at the city of Evanston any structural engineers or coastal engineers. Okay. Um, so I guess I'm just concerned about paying some, like instead of just paying directly somebody to build a ramp, why we're ha hiring first paying a consultant to consult to, <laughs> to advise us on how to then hire someone to build a ramp, I think we need to build a ramp, an ADA ramp. I'm just concerned that we're spending more than we really need to, that in fact we should just simply be paying someone to build a ramp. It looks to me like this is consulting on building a ramp, on an ADA, ADA ramp. I'm, I, 
It is the data collection, which has to do with geotech and various other issues, and it is conceptual design to determine where the ramp would be and exactly what it would cost and certain elements of the ramp. This does not include the contract documents or the bidding services or the construction oversight. That cost has been provided um, to the city. The total cost for all of the things, including what is being proposed tonight, would be $109,000 approximately. But that's just the consulting services. Thank you. I guess my question is also with the firms that would bid, would they not also provide um, a scope of or a plan with an ADA ramp? I, they, if we wanted to go that route, they would have to hire the consultant themselves. And so they wouldn't really be giving us a low bid because they wouldn't have done the preliminary work and the structural design to make sure that the ADA ramp could be built according to code. They would have to hire a structural engineer. We can hire a structural and coastal engineer. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. But I have a couple questions. So why Smith Group, if I'm understanding correctly, they're already on the job on the Evanston shoreline, and since they're here already doing a lot of the work, that would have to be done anyway? Yes. It's actually in their scope of work um, to just generally be looking at solutions along the lakefront for a variety of areas. So they have already completed some of the work that would be necessary, um, the bathymetric bathometric survey, the topographic survey, and they have um, coastal engineers and structural engineers so that they would be qualified to do this. We were also directed as staff to try to move promptly along with this. If we were to hire somebody separately, we would need to go out for RFP, which would take us three months prior to actually starting any planning or um, conceptual design. And if it did go to a separate company, they would have to repeat a lot of the work that Smith Group has already done. We could probably, um, I mean, we could use some of the data. The data is ours. Group, it's not theirs. Yeah, the data is ours. But they would have to then have staff that become familiar with it, become familiar with generally the issues that Evanston's been doing. So it would take a while for them to get up to speed. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have another more kind of fundamental question is what would happen if we had a dog beach without an ADA ramp? So Other than people with disabilities being unable to get to the dog beach. From the training that we have been provided with our consultant who did the ADA transition plan, which is a legally required document, there is a federal law, the American with Disabilities Act, which requires all municipalities to provide all services to people with disabilities in an equitable fashion to people without disabilities. And so if we choose to go forward without doing this and without having a plan for doing it, then we would open ourselves up to liability if somebody wanted to go to the city, hey, I have a disability and you're performing or providing a service in your, or a facility and you are not accommodating disabilities, then we would be legally required to do that and potentially pay a settlement as well. Okay, thank you. So, I, um, and so in terms of their, because we you know, paid handsomely for this contract with Smith Group, um, so they were not instructed to make that part of their plan? They were instructed to provide shoreline protection, which is very different than providing an ADA ramp. Because what they brought to, this, to the library, that was a lot more than just shoreline protection. The plans that they put forward and had the residents comment on that went well beyond shoreline protection. I mean, there are parks and... They were contracted to provide shoreline protection, but what that looks like a little bit has to do, I think, with what people want to be able to use the shoreline for. And so that is part of why they are asking the bigger question, which is what do you want the long-term use to be? Because that would inform what the options for shoreline protection are. 
Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, all in favor of item A9? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, item A9 passes. Um, item A10. Madam Chair, I'll move item A10, approval of contract amendment number four with Safe Built Incorporated for inspection and plan review services. Uh, and this is in an amount of $60,000. Thank you, Ms. Flax. Um, I, uh, Sarah Flax, Interim Community Development Director. Um, currently, all of our residential plan reviews are done by SafeBuilt. Um, SafeBuilt has a local office. They are not flying in from out of town. Um, Gerald Keyes is our regular plan reviewer and um, has worked very closely with the city since we started using them in 2013 as backup. Um, currently, we do not have a residential plan reviewer on staff, so if we do not increase our contract, we don't have any residential plan reviews, which I don't think is very something we can accept. Um, what we've put in the budget for next year is actually to seek to hire a residential plan reviewer. Um, we have estimated that staff person at about um, $107,000 um, for salary and benefits. And we think that will give us a better ability to um, respond to questions and changes that we always have, especially because a lot of our residential uh, work is in, you know, it's, it's additions, it's things, it's, it's, you're working with something that's already built and there can be a lot of questions on how, how do you make things compliant. Um, we would still, uh, we still have proposed in that budget a $50,000 uh, safe built contract because safe built not only does residential plan review um, and would do um, help if there was a high demand at any given point um, they also are backup for our um, building inspections uh, we currently have one building inspector for each type of inspections and so if any of them are out on vacation ill or anything like that it gives us the ability to respond so this contract includes both plan review and inspection services? Yes, it does. So, um, but they are, they're, where are they located? I honestly don't know exactly where their local office is, but it's local. Gerald comes in all the time. So I know sometimes they've reviewed permits. I've had the experience where they've made you know mistakes and it wasn't their fault. It was because they aren't on site. They said that they were several hours away. So for example, when somebody said they were replacing something that was already existent, they approved it just based on our code and then it turned out that in fact it wasn't accurate information and because they're so far away, they said, you know, they don't go on site to review to see if something was already existing. So I, I do feel like there is a little bit of an, an issue with that they aren't, you know, Gerald, I don't know how often he's here. I think I spoke directly with Gerald. Um, but that's happened at least twice since I've been on where there have been issues of permits being approved that shouldn't have been approved because they weren't able to do the visit. Because he, as they said, because as he told me, they were located far away. Far is a relative term. Um, they have a local office. It is not in Loveland, Colorado, so, so which is what I'm saying. So um, I don't know those circumstances, mm -hmm. but there can be situations where plans are not complete and or they have inaccuracies and um, our residential plan reviewer didn't normally go out to look on site either, but could in a case like that um, if something came up. Okay. Um, I guess one of the issues I have too is that we don't really have a good, um, currently, and I know we're working on this trying to get better data, to really understand the need um, for safe built, and that would be helpful going forward when we approve these third-party contracts to support and bolster our, our program, our department at the city, to really be able to see from year to year the difference and why we would need to increase this. We can provide Thank you. additional data in the future, but as I say, right now, if we don't have safe built, we don't have residential plan review. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments? All right. All in favor, item A10. Bye. Okay. No, nobody opposed. Item A10 passes. 
Okay, we now move to, oh, now, uh, let's see, we move to, we already passed the consent agenda, minus those items. We move to items for consideration, item A11. Uh, so moved. Item A11, resolution recognizing the public benefit of the city paying private sewer repair line costs in excess of 15000 per repair, $15,000 per repair for a residential property. Okay, item A11 has been moved by Councilmember Burns and seconded by Councilmember Harris. Um, I think, um, is there an amendment on that from Councilmember Harris? Thank you. Um, what, I wanted, what I did want to talk about and look at, it talked about a $200,000 of a family that has $200,000 or more of income. And that, to me, is not Okay, so thank you. So we would amend it to leave as is, but change it to offer a, to make it so that if you earn 100,000 or less, we reduce it to 5,000. Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Stonebeck, do you have that? Do you need that submitted? Um, I think Councilmember Harris doesn't have a computer tonight to send that in. So it would remain as it stands with 15000 at two hundred, but at $100,000 or less, um, the burden would be at $5,000. 5000 correct. Um, Would you like to make the motion for that amendment? Yes, I move that we change the order that if the, fa the household family is $100,000 or less, that they are only responsible for the first 5000 Okay. All right, second. Okay. And then I'll, if I can talk during. No, you got to open it up for discussion, and I'll speak okay. during this Thank discussion. Thank you. Okay, so we'll open that up for discussion. So currently it's as it's stated in the packet, but we're amending to add also that if you're at 100000 it's reduced to 5000 And I open that up for discussion. Councilmember Burns. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to say, so we've this has now come back, I don't know, maybe three or four times. And um, so I realized where I was confused. So I... My thought initially was that um, was that this included the portion of the sewer line um, that, in a water line sense, you know, the uh, uh, a private owner will be responsible for, uh, which is covered by insurance up to ten thousand dollars. And I've looked into it, called a bunch of different insurance companies. Um, I realize now that we're we've been talking about the part of the sewer line between the property line. I guess you'll say and the water main, or is it, what is it? Is it the water main? All right, not the water main, the sewer, yeah, I was gonna say, it can't be that. So what is it called? The sewer main. So in, 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 in water line terms, it's very simple. It's like, this, this, is, this person, this is uh, the water line that the private uh, owner is responsible for between the, 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 the house and the, the buffalo, what is it called, the, the bee box? the Buffalo box, and then the water line from, from that that's typically in the, the parkway and the water main is responsible to the city. Very simple. To me, this should be that simple. I didn't realize that what, that's what we were talking about. I don't, I'm actually not sure why the city has not covered between, and I know it's, it's typical that cities don't do this, but I don't see why we haven't a while ago decided that we were going to cover it from the property line um, to, the, to, the, to the sewer, whatever, sewer sewer main in the same way we do for the water line. Like I, I actually don't understand why we don't do that. So I'm actually comfortable, definitely comfortable with these amendments because we're not saying that we're going to cover 100% of the cost, but a certain you know portion of it over a certain amount. Um, what I do want to make clear is that in the same way that we've budgeted for the part of the water service line, right, that we know is our responsibility, we need to do the same for sewer line, which in talking to, to, to Dave about this, he said that if, that if we, um, you know, that if we can't find this in any other budget, we'll have to go into our sewer reserves, which year over year we want to keep that at about two and a half, just in case you know we have any issues, and we don't really want to go under that. 
And um, and if we do, we're going to have to increase our sewer rates. So I just want the general public to know that that if we do go over that amount, that will like they'll likely be a time where we need to adjust our sewer rates, which I'm completely fine with because, again, I think it makes sense moving forward to just communicate to residents in whatever way we want to do it, that in the same way we're responsible for the water service line from here to here, we're now responsible for the sewer line between here and here. So in my mind, this completely makes sense now. It's just it's it's a decision on whether or not the city wants to, to take on that cost, and I'm certainly fine with it. We do it for water service lines. Uh, I think we should do it for sewer lines. I understand from talking to Dave that there's a lot more risk involved with sewer lines because they're not as well maintained as water lines are and that, that, you know, that there are likely many that will fail and fail soon and fail often at some point. But, again, I think as long as the city understands uh, the, 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 the potential costs and we're willing to, to meet that cost, whether it's through our reserve, our sewer reserves, or increase in rates, then I'm, I'm for it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Burns. Councilmember Reed? Yeah, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, what Councilmember Burns said there. I just do on one thing want to note so there isn't a panic that you know sewer rates are going to raise. Um, I think staff has estimated at least for the last, I forget Dave, is it a decade or maybe half a decade that uh, there's been about one of these failures on average per year. And so we're, we're talking about something that's, you know, potentially, it's certainly less than $50,000 a year on average, at least what we've seen over the last 10 years, which unless staff expects that we're at some, the end of some life cycle that's about to, to expire and we're gonna expect a huge number of our sewers to fail in the next few years. Um, I think we're safe on, 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 on our reserves and not having to raise taxes for this. Great, thank you, Councilmember uh, Reed. Okay, um, all in favor of item, if there's no, any yeah. further discussion? I, Sorry. I'm already on the record with my objections to this in the interest of time, I will refer anybody who's interested to my previous comments. But we do have a motion uh, on the table to amend. Oh, right, to amend so that we're adding that for those under 100, who make 100,000 or less, the um, obligation would be to pay the first 5,000, 200 or less, it's the first 15, we did. And, um, okay, is there, a, there was a second. All in favor of the amended motion? Aye. Aye. Aye, any objections? All in favor of the amendment. The, the, the amendment. amendment. Yeah, I'm sorry, correct. of the amendment. Yes. yes. Okay. The amendment passed. Um, we now move to vote on the motion. Um, I, I'm amended. sorry, on the resolution A11. Um, as amended. Yeah. As amended. Item A11 as amended. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Nay. So four um, in favor. In it's just the ayes have it. When the we ayes have voice it. Vote, we don't count. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Councilman Reed. Okay, the ayes have it. So Council Mem uh, item A11 is recommended to Council and a vote of four to one. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I'll move item A12, Resolution 115R22, authorizing the city manager to enter into a nine-month renewal lease agreement for studio space at the Noise Cultural Arts Center with Evanston Children's Choir. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Item A12 passes. Um, I move item A13, resolution 116R22, authorizing the city manager to enter into a 12-month lease agree, enter into 12-month lease agreements for studio spaces at Noise Cultural Arts Center. Second. Um, all in favor of item A13? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, A13 passed. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move item A14, Resolution 117R22, the contract with Hoffman House Catering for Senior Meal Food Program. Second. Okay, item A14, all in favor? Aye. Any discussion? Sorry. <laughs> so sorry. I'm sure we'll Thanks wait. Thanks for your patience. Any discussion on item A14? Trying to take away our voice, Chair. No, sorry about that. No, you're good. No discussion? Okay. Oh, oh I'm, I apologize. Um, <laughs> Council Member Harris? It's okay. I mean, just reading this, I just wasn't sure why, if any Evanston um, 
agencies came up, seeing that this wasn't in our area um, to feed our seniors. So I just had a question about that. Um, is there somebody who can respond to that? Uh, I'm not sure if Audrey Thompson is available or not. She was going to be on Zoom, hopefully. And if not, I can uh, get your response by the city council meeting. Do you want to hold that for a response? Or, okay. Any further discussion on item A14? You don't want to hold it? No, I want to. Yeah, well, get my light on. Let my lights on. Sorry, Councilmember Reed. Yeah, speaking of local agencies, uh, we do have Meals on Wheels, which is located here in Evanston. I wonder, you know, if, if, if expanding if they have the capacity to expand and if they do it might make sense to use them as I suppose they hire local folks uh, you know they oh, well well and they got other stuff so yeah I, I think it would make sense to uh, I, I, I wonder if there's the opportunity to look into meals on wheels or if staff already has if Audrey or someone is available When I spoke to uh, Director Thompson earlier today, she indicated she would be on Zoom. I'm assuming she will be here for the Zoom meeting. I will contact her after this meeting and uh, let her know your concerns. Great, thank you. Okay, all in favor of item A14? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, item A14. Okay, um, one opposed. Um, item A14. Actually, can we? Yep. Can we do a roll? Um, I'm going to also uh, for now. Okay. So this is a roll vote for item A14. A14. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Burns. Aye. Council Member Reed. No. Council Member Harris. No. Council Member Kelly. No. So it's defeated then. Uh, three to two. Uh, why don't we just hold it? Then? Yeah. Yeah, what, okay. yeah. Do you want to move to hold it? Yeah, that's why I said, do we want to hold it? But I mean, it, get, get it's already right done. Now. Motion to reconsider. Let's reconsider. Yeah. Motion to reconsider. It. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll second the motion to reconsider. Okay. Okay, so is there motion to hold? Well, first we have to motion vote on the motion to reconsider. All in, favor. All in favor. Aye. Aye. All in favor to Aye. reconsider. Aye. Aye. All right. And then I, I move to uh, table or to hold to table this until our next meeting. Um, and I'd just like for the director to look into um, whether a local agency is an option, whether it be Mills on Wheels or anything else in the city. And if, if possible, I'd, I'd like to go with that. Uh, so I move to table this to the next meeting. Second. Uh, Council Cummings is. Just uh, good evening, members of the Administration, Administration and Public Works Committee, Corporation Council Nicholas Cummings. Just wanted to give you guys the information. This is a renewal of this contract. So this is an agency that we've been using for quite some time. Um, I don't know that it, if it would uh, if, if it would need to go out to bid, um, but for this program, which would start, I want to say the contract terminated October 31st. And this is a, a new one, so it's a renewal, is my understanding. Um, I was not able to look at this one, but do we know what when this? When does the service itself end? Like when? To because to, to Councilmember Harris, the earlier points you made, I, I do want to make sure we're feeding the seniors. Um, so how if we hold this today, will it impact? Um, I mean. I what would it impact? Right, Again, I'm, I'm going off memory at this point right now in terms of the, the dates, so because I'm not looking at the packet right now. But Anderson. This, you this was Audrey a uh, renewal. Yeah. yeah, so it's supposed to, this will be to start October 1st through September 30th, 2023, is what this renewal would do. So, so we're probably good then. October 1st, 2023, you said it would start. It would start October 1st of this year, which means we're already in the contract. So this contract oh, okay. would be to formalize something that's already going on right now. Well, then I would ask that we, if we're going to hold it, hold it at council because I need some time to, I think we all need some time to look at. 
uh, uh, Director Thomas has been trying to get into the Zoom and nobody was letting her in. And so we can work this out before City Council if you would please give us the opportunity. It's up to the group, but but knowing that information, we got to make sure the seniors are okay. Yeah, so I would say if, you're, if, if we're okay with moving this forward to Council so we have time to look into it and we can do whatever we need to there, is that okay? So the, the importance is that we make sure we feed the seniors yes. and then moving yeah. forward that we – are local so Absolutely. my first paramount I want to be clear I want to feed the seniors Absolutely. and then second comes if this is already happening and we don't have time to pause that we move forward yeah. and then look for future contracts to be local and uh, uh, chair just uh, I, I would like to add that I also I think it makes sense to bring this to the council before the contract is already expired and we're several months down the line, uh, so we have that time, uh, so, uh, yeah. Thank you. I think we have Director Tom Thompson. Thompson, Thompson yes. Tom Thompson. Yeah. Yes, this is Audrey Thompson, Director of Parks and Rec. Uh, so this is the third renewal for the contract. Uh, so please know that um, when the contract goes out for bid the next year, then Meals on Wheels or anyone else local will have the opportunity to bid for that contract. Thank you very much, Director Thompson. You're welcome. Thank you. So I think we go back to the original and vote because, again, we're already a month and a half lapsed from the contract, which is scary, as Councilmember Reed stated, and that we make sure our seniors are fed. So I move that we... Don't reconsider? How do we fix that, Jen? So you, I think you back just to, move item A14 yeah. now. Yeah, it's already cool. moved. And seconded? Has it been well, removed and seconded? When you reconsider it, you bring it back on. Okay, the all right, then all in favor of item A14? Aye. 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 Any objections? Okay, A14 passes. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, I'll move item A15, Resolution 118R22, authorizing the settlement and release of all claims in MAC versus City of Evanston et al. Second. Any discussion? No, no discussion. All in favor of item A15? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Okay, A15 passes. A16? Uh, Madam Chair, I move item A16, Ordinance 122-022, amending section 10-11-5C, Schedule VC of the Evanston City Code, which is three-way stops. Uh, we're talking about a three-way stop at Florence Avenue and Washington Street. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor, A16? A. Aye. 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 No opposed? Okay, A16 passes. Item A7? In the, yeah, in the interest of time, yes. uh, presuming uh, that we don't have discussion on these items, I'd like to move item A17, A18, and A19 concurrently. Second. Okay. Any objections? No objection, but I do have a comment before we vote. Okay, Councilmember Newsom. Oh, I think yeah. we need a second. Did you get a second? I thought minute? we got one. Yeah, Councilmember Harris. Second. I'll second. Um, yeah, I'm in favor of these. I just want to point out that uh, the annual savings to a single-family home uh, by switching from a 95-gallon uh, waste cart to a 65-gallon waste cart is $155.87. By doing the right thing, using a little bit less stuff, yeah. uh, you can save more than $150 a year. Thank you. And Councilmember Reed? Yeah. I, I, I think we need to have, uh, uh, I appreciate Councilmember Newsma's point there. I, I do think we need to have a real discussion about um, trash collection uh, soon. I'm sorry, make sure we're talking about the right waste carts. Um, Right. Okay. Motion. Yes. And so uh, I think we need to uh, have a conversation about trash delivery. I think, you know, uh, there could be great cost savings to the city, uh, to residents, uh, if we explored the idea, and, and, you know, particularly in my ward, and I think likely all over the city, we're likely getting a lot of complaints about, uh, about rats and uh, other vector 
Um, and, you know, you look at some countries like Norway, um, where instead of having a cart behind every single house or a, a bin behind every single house, uh, folks go to centralized locations to uh, deposit their trash. And I mean, you, you brought the trash into your house one way or another. You brought it in uh, when you went shopping. And I think the idea that we would send a city worker to every single house to personally pick up your trash for you and haul it off to a centralized location, I think we need to really rethink that model. Um, and I know we're just talking about the, the cost of bins here, but, um, you know, for a number of reasons, uh, you know, there, there are even some studies about the health impacts of having to maybe walk a block or two to th and the social impacts of, you know, meeting at potentially a centralized location to throw your trash, you get to know your neighbors better a little bit. Um, I think we need to think big and bold. Um, and we're not there on this vote, uh, but, uh, but I do think we need to start thinking about that and, and, and the cost savings uh, that we could provide Evanston residents and the efficiencies that we could provide uh, for the city uh, government if we, if we rethought the way we do trash collection. Thank, Thank you. you, Council Member Reed. Okay, so we're moving um, all in favor of items A17, I'm sorry, A16, A17, A18, and A19. All right, so it's A17 through 19. I'm sorry, A17 through A19. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, A17 through A19. Pass. Okay, items for discussion. Madam Chair, I'll move item D1 uh, for discussion. This is resolution 119R22, authorizing the city staff to issue a memo to the police department. Uh, the Traffic Enforcement Division with a notification regarding incoming delivery trucks to Evanston Lumber. Second. Okay, discussion item D1. And for some context on this, uh, I think the first time this issue came before this committee was several months ago. Um, we might be getting into double di digit months ago. And as the representatives from Evanston Lumber pointed out, the, uh, the problem is that the intersection at Main Street and Custer is very difficult for the large uh, semi trucks to maneuver. Uh, this is, uh, doesn't really have an impact on Evanston Lumber's business. Uh, the potential impact is on citizens of Evanston, uh, whether they're in cars, uh, whether they are uh, pedestrians, um, also the taxpayers of Evanston in that there has been over the course of time uh, regular property damage to signs getting knocked over at that corner. Uh, the Union Pacific uh, Railroad abutment uh, has deteriorated because trucks have run into it. And there exists quite a, a serious and significant uh, safety risk at that intersection due to the uh, due to this situation. Um, there is not a, an optimal solution here. Uh, we have discussed uh, with city staff uh, over the course of time a number of potential solutions when it was first uh, brought to this committee several months ago, we were talking about changing a truck route. We have decided, uh, or it's been discussed and kind of concluded that changing a truck route uh, is not the best option because that would open up Oakton or possibly Howard to any number of trucks when really it's just the trucks going to Evanston Lumber that are the issue here. Uh, so we have looked at the possibility of having trucks come down Howard and turn north on Custer there. That's a, honestly a, probably a little bit better than going uh, going east on uh, on Main Street and making the turn on Custer. But the Custer and Howard intersection is also difficult to navigate. If you look at the map, it's also an acute angle, which means this is a right angle for our you know sophomore geometry review. This is an acute angle, which makes it tar harder to turn. Um, so Howard Street isn't a great option, and even if that intersection were good, we'd be coming up a longer stretch uh, of, of Custer, which is uh, a residential street. So uh, no one here is suggesting that the option on the table to bring trucks uh, down Oakton and, and have them turn north on Custer is a great idea. 
because there are two schools on, on Oakton uh, that we have two st schools on, on Main Street as well. So that, you know, the school issue is, is potentially a wash here. Um, Oakton isn't, uh, isn't a great uh, solution. I will readily concede that, but it's not as bad of an idea as having trucks uh, coming down Main Street and turning on to Oakton. So this is something that Council Member Hedekatis and I have discussed uh, very cordially and respectfully, and uh, he looking out for the benefits of his constituents, I looking out for the benefit of my constituents, and we were unable to uh, come to a resolution, just the two of us, we uh, asked Mayor Biss to moderate and see if we could uh, come to uh, a, a, an agreement with, with Mayor Biss, kind of facilitating and moderating the discussion. Uh, no avail there, and uh, we realized that it, the only way to kind of get through this issue would be to bring it to the council uh, for a vote, even though I will point out, and maybe I should have started with this, we don't have to vote here. Uh, what we are proposing is uh, taking advantage of existing city code, which allows trucks to deviate from uh, published truck routes for a number of, uh, of reasons, one of which is if there's a safety risk, which clearly exists in this case. So we don't actually have to vote. This is current policy. The policy, we're not changing policy, but staff doesn't want to make that recommendation to the police department, you know, give them the heads up that this is going to change without council support. I think staff's doing the right thing in this, in this case. Staff doesn't want to get caught between uh, council member Hedekatis and myself. Uh, so I guess we're bringing it to the council to decide uh, to, you know, try and split the baby here and do what's, uh, do what's right since we can't figure it out ourselves. Thank you, council right. member Newsom. Um, and I, I do have a, a video, Anderson. Um, if you, that first one on sometimes trucks turn south on Custer and back in. Yeah, there we go. And we could probably skip to about 30 seconds in to uh, where it gets good. Uh, maybe this is a different video, but it doesn't. Sometimes trucks uh, attempt to make the turn there and end up running over the stop sign, which is uh, right next to the post office right there. This view is from, um, uh, is from, no, uh, La Principal, the taco restaurant across the street from the post office. That blue awning is the post office there. Some of the other videos, we don't have to watch them all, uh, will show that go down one good there right there yeah and this will show you and you can skip to about 30 seconds in on this one too that truck decides not to try and attempt the left hand turn but instead turns right which is an easier turn kind of southbound on uh, on Custer uh, and and then backs in to Evanston Lumber kind of blindly through the intersection at Main Street uh, and so this is, you know, the health and, and safety risk that I'm most concerned about. Uh, it's some uh, damage to property, a, a, an automobile accident, or a pedestrian not knowing what's going on, and the truck backing through blindly. Somebody's going to get hurt here. Uh, and that's the, the safety uh, concern that's driving this discussion. Thank you. Council Member Reed? Yeah, uh, I appreciate uh, Jonathan's uh, uh, explanation here and advocacy. I it also, when this was originally going to run through the eighth ward, um, you know, using uh, Custer as a truck route, uh, residents were really concerned about that because uh, Custer is uh, a, a, a completely residential uh, street for that stretch from Howard to uh, at least Oakton um, and then almost all the way down to. Uh, Main Street. And so I uh, was opposed to having this run through uh, the 8th Ward. I mean, it's still essentially going down Oakton, running through the 8th Ward, because it's right on the, you know, it, Oakton is the border of the 8th and 9th Ward, so it's not like the exhaust aren't uh, spewing over. And, and that's really my main concern. Uh, the south end of town, particularly the 8th Ward, uh, has the lowest air quality in our city. Um, and, you know, I'm concerned about adding extra uh, exhaust. I think this solution is a bit better because it doesn't open up 
the the you know it doesn't open up the gates to allowing trucks to come down Howard and use Oakton as a main thoroughfare. I I'm a little confused why staff would feel like they're in you know like they might be coming between uh, you know council members because right now the law as it is allows for uh, Evanston Lumber and their uh, delivery uh, 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 drivers to use Oakton already. Uh, so it, it, it in, unless we're saying it doesn't, are we, are we clear that the code would allow them to use Oakton and then shut down Custer to, to make their delivery? Is that a, is that clear that our current code would allow that? In my interpretation of the code, yes, it would. Okay. Yeah, it, what we're talking about is Section 10-1-9-2, which is commercial vehicles of excessive weight prohibited on certain streets. Uh, Section A, no motor vehicle having a total gross weight, blah, 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 shall travel on a, and operate on any city street except as further provided for in this ordinance. Uh, and then uh, Paragraph 3, operational constraints. Vehicles may use the non-truck routes when physical characteristics of the street, intersection, or viaduct cause operational or safety problems to reach the final destination, which is clearly the case here. There's a half-mile exclusion as well. That's not what we're invoking here. Okay. Yeah, and so in this case, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not excited to move this forward. Uh, Given council authorization, I you know I agree with Councilmember Hericatis that I think uh, you know we we don't want this coming through our side of town. Um, so I, you know I, I I wonder if we should just really I don't I, I don't support this moving forward to council. I think you know staff should just enforce the law as it is, and our police department I think is fully equipped to interpret the law and understand the law and enforce the law appropriately. Um, and so I think if we if we have a clear understanding, uh, that's that's where we should be. I, I lastly, um, I, I, I I'll, I'll let Juan. I see you've come up to the podium. Yeah, okay. Councilmember um, Heracatis. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Um, so I've talked with this um, with Jonathan about this a lot. I just wanted to share some my my side of the um, argument, so to speak. So I, I sent you all um, some traffic numbers that I've received from um, our traffic engineers here at the city. Um, next summer, um, the city is is go undergoing a Oakton um, traffic calming project because Oakton is already extremely congested and has a lot of pedestrian um, safety issues with crosswalks at the um, public transit stops on Oakton, as well as James Park. Uh, if you've ever been there on a weekend when uh, soccer or baseball is happening, it's very congested. And then there's also three schools. So you have Dawes, Chute, and Oakton, which all drop off at Oakton. And if you can imagine having some of those semis coming down um, during the mornings there. So rough numbers here, and I've all sent this all to you. So from Dodge to As to Home Depot, it's 19,000 vehicles. From Dodge to Asbury, 14,400. Asbury to Chicago, 12,700. And this is for Oakton. Then the main traffic, um, West City limits to Dodge, 16,500. Dodge to Ridge, 13,500. And Ridge to Chicago is 9,000. So it, there's considerably a lot more traffic. Um, and then there's also just I think that a lot of the, the residents, and especially in the ninth, the west part of the ninth ward, just feel like they have the burden of all you know the environmental hazards from the businesses in the area. And I would, would definitely hope that we would not move this to council and that we would find some other solution to the traffic issue. So thank you. Yeah, if, if I can just wrap okay. up. Uh, council Member Reed. Go ahead. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to give Councilmember Hedicott has a chance, but I want to wrap up. 
So what, what I really think, uh, you know, and I see the owners are here, and so I appreciate your involvement. I think we actually had an opportunity to meet at some point virtually with Councilmember Newsma or someone from your team to discuss this. Um, I, you know, again, I'm fine with the law as is, and I think that maybe, you know, I'd support, I'd be a, uh, co-sponsor Councilmember Hedekatis if you know if we want to put in an amendment to our current code to make this not allowable or to sp specifically prohibit trucks on certain stretches um, but right now it is allowed and I'm supportive of just I mean it's it's allowed so you know, I don't have to be supportive or un unsupportive of anything uh, because it's currently allowed and until we change it they have the right to do yeah. what they have the right to do I, I just do wonder, you know, if there's a longer term uh, solution to this uh, that reduces those semis coming in, whether it's, you know, bifurcating where you're doing some of the work and finding another location where, um, you know, for, I don't fully understand what your business does, so apologies, but if there's, you know, a way to divert some of that traffic somewhere else where it's, uh, you know, one where we can eliminate the traffic concerns uh, or the pedestrian safety concerns, and also, uh, you know, keep some of that traffic out of the particularly residential areas of the city. Um, I think that's a, you know, that's the ultimate solution that I'd like uh, to to see in the long term. Uh, I'll end there. I'd like to speak to the volume of traffic and the number I have uh, from Evanston uh, Lumber. And correct me if I'm wrong or if the numbers have changed, but we're saying approximately 30 semis a week. Right, with a higher volume on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, a little bit lower on Tuesday, Thursday, and the majority of the traffic in the morning, a little bit in the afternoon, but not much. And let's just clarify that we're talking about long haul over the road semis are the ones that we're having a problem with. Your delivery trucks that are contractors coming in to pick up lumber or your trucks delivering lumber to job sites, those are smaller, they can make the turn at Main Street. They're not an issue. It's really just these limited number of trucks that we're talking about. Um, and you know, for that reason, this strikes me as the best solution to a problem. Uh, we're not proposing to make Oakton a truck route. That would solve the problem uh, we're talking about here, but it also would open up Oakton to any number of other trucks. And you know, I'll agree, Oakton is also a busy street. Uh, and uh, you know, want to look out for the residents uh, along Oakton. Um, but since we do have the kind of clear and present danger uh, at Oak at Maine and Custer, I think this is the uh, the most palatable of, uh, of a variety of not so good options. I would agree with that. I would also like to suggest that the police department is notified that this is happening. So these over-the-road truck drivers are not getting harassed and hassled and ticketed for something that they shouldn't be. Yeah. I, and I think that's, that's fair, and I think we can work here. with, the, okay. with the police department with that. Thank you. Okay. So this is just for discussion. We're not taking a vote on it tonight. Councilmember Burns? I mean, I guess that's my first question before I um, get into it is, are we looking to bring this back to de decide whether or not we're you know, are you looking for ultimately? Are we looking for a vote on this, or is it just a discussion? Because if it's just a discussion, then I'm, you know, feel how Councilman Reed feels that I mean, we can leave this up to staff to determine what they feel is best. But if you're looking for a response from from council and an eventual vote, then I will have some questions and some things I'd like staff to bring back. So, I guess I'll leave that to Councilman Tadikaris. I'm comfortable going along with current policy and allowing uh, having some lumber to reach out to your suppliers and reminding them uh, that they uh, are allowed to do what we're proposing here. I don't want to step on Councilmember Hedekatis' toes or the toes of his residents without allowing him a, a say in this. Thanks. Um, personally, I want to have residents weigh in on this. I think we already had a ton of feedback today from people. Um, Pretty much everyone I've talked to who lives in that neighborhood already complains about trucks that aren't supposed to be there going down Oakton. Same with um, Asbury. And so I think this is a huge problem, and I, I would like us to 
address, give people time to weigh in and then address it at their next meeting. Yeah, so if we're looking for more time, then you're you're okay with this coming back for intro at the next meeting? Sure. Well, point, it would be action. To, to, no, well, to be clear, action, so. the only thing we'd be doing is directing staff to do what we've essentially some former council has already directed staff to do in the police department. So there's the only thing, what Council Member Nusma is essentially, or what's in our agenda is approving a resolution that would direct staff to do what the law is, which I don't know if we really need to direct staff. I think if anything's coming back, it might be some other policy, but there'd be nothing sub substantive that we'd be voting Yeah, and on. I, I'm not talking about a policy. What I'm saying is are we, we do not need to vote on this. Correct. But if, if we're we want to uh, obtain quick, the status if, quo. But if we're being asked to vote on something, then I have questions and some direction for staff. So I just want to make sure, is this coming back for intro and an eventual vote, or is it? The, the agreed upon when we had the, the meeting with the mayor was that this should go go to a vote for a vote okay. for a vote. All right. So yeah. then I do have a question. So um, for staff, I guess one, um, I think it was mentioned earlier that there's a there's a, a space that you're not supposed to park, but people park there. If no one ever parked there, would that improve things? And and if so, how much? Or does that improve things on the days that that no one is parked there? Are they able to make that turn? There's the video that we just saw gave a clear gave an example of you know there was no car parked near that corner and there was, and there was still, still an issue yeah, yeah and if you if you uh removed one or two additional spaces on main on that side of the street would that help I, i'm yeah okay no it's the because it's not a degree it is not a 90 degree angle so the relief that you need is on what side of the street if there was relief it, would it be on the the what is it the 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 train side of things on the, it's the north because, northeast corner because we, of the angle because it's not a ninety degree angle making a turn f as you're heading eastbound on this map towards the right and then turning to your left going northbound it's just too tight of a turn to make with these very long trucks I understand so, so if relief was granted somewhere. Where would it need to be in order to get this truck to, to turn? Would okay. it be we would need to push back the, the I'm not You would have to duty. push back the, the post office you would have to push back the building that's on the corner. That, of so that the relief would need yeah. to be on the south uh, west side of the street, the, where the post yeah. office is the, currently. The northwest corner. Corner, yeah. Where that blue awning is, is that building and the sidewalk adjacent to it is prohibiting the okay. truck. Okay, so we would need to get rid of that. <laughs> In order well, for the, the provide the post release office, for the turn to be made. The post office is offset three to four feet from the curb, okay. which is a sidewalk. And on the other side, the embankment, which is actually a retaining wall in this location, is like two feet from the curb on the other side. So you'd have to move the embankment or the post office building. And we're in the process of completing design on the Main Street Streetscape project for construction next year. And we really looked at this corner to figure out how to improve it, but it's pretty marginal what we can do because we're bound by the post office building and the, the retaining wall for the embankment. And you can't push that back any further than it is? No. Not a foot, not two feet, not anything without compromising the um, structure of it? No. The, okay. This is nowhere close to a uh, turning radius that works for a large okay. truck. Well, I mean, that's to me, that's the ball game. I mean, it's you know, that was my the question I had is that if there's relief somewhere, we can move remove parking spaces. If we can push this back, push that back. But if you're saying there's nothing that we can do on this site, in order to uh, to create the 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 right angle, then I don't even need another you know meeting, unfortunately, because that was all of my questions had to do with that. I mean, we clearly see here it's a it's a tight it's a it's a tight turn uh you know assuming these truckers know what they're doing which i know they do there was on one of the photos i saw there was a the stop sign was in the photo but there were some shoes there too and they were empty nobody was in them so hopefully nobody got injured that day <laughs> did you see that but uh but yeah no it's, if there's no relief that could be granted I, I think it's pretty clear what what unfortunately what needs to be done here um that's all i can think of so uh, that's all 
Any other comments? Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate that there isn't nothing that can be done. Um, you know, I do think in a long term, in the over the long term, it given that there is, uh, you know, from a structural or design standpoint, there's nothing we can do. I think it may indicate maybe maybe they've outgrown the area, and maybe you know part of the business needs to be relocated somewhere where there isn't uh, you know an eighty degree you know turn um, you know that with they're going to have constant semis, and so instead of subjecting South Enders and you know Eighth Waters where we already have lower air quality and you know the other concerns to a bunch of semis, maybe, you know, this business can in the long term try to figure out another solution. So in the short term, I think this, in the immediate term, we want to make sure people are safe. We don't want semis blindly backing up into to businesses, but I, I think really we need to start a long-term discussion on, on how we handle this. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Okay, then we'll move to our... The shoreline, the presentation on our shoreline repair, shoreline stabilization. Madam Chair, I'll move item D2, presentation of the status of the Evanston Shoreline Repair Project under RFQ 21-45. Okay. Been moved by Councilmember Newsman, seconded by Councilmember Harris. And I'd like to introduce uh, the representative from Smith Group here who is here to give us the uh, presentation. Good evening. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. My name is Mark Wagstaff. Um, I'm a principal at the Smith Group in Chicago, um, and I'll be uh, talking to you about the Shoreline Repair Project. Um, so the, uh, the presentation is uh, organized into a little bit of background information, um, why this project is, is, is mo moving forward. Um, uh, some also some additional information about previous work that was done around 2020, um, and then where we are with the current project, the scope, the status, and then what is going to be the next steps. And I'm very happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, every, when we're talking about Lake Michigan and the shoreline protection, um, the lake level in Lake Michigan is the governing um, factor. Um, when the lake level is low, we have more beach in front of the structures, um, and the waves that arrive at the shoreline are much smaller and, and much less energetic. When the lake level is high, then we get much larger waves coming much closer to shore, and it's not a linear relationship. So those high lake levels that we experience, we get very damaging conditions. Um, this chart here shows um, monthly average Lake Michigan levels for over 100 years of, of record. And you can see in the blue box right in um, um, 2020, we had record high lake levels. But that was... Um, that came right after a period in 2020, so 2012, 2013, when we had had record low lake levels. Um, and so it's very variable, um, and we don't know what is going to happen in the future. When we had those record lake levels, um, and this pair of images um, sort of illustrates uh, a big difference that you can see um, between April 
2013, which is on the left-hand side, and May 2021, which is on the right-hand side. In particular, you can see how much um, erosion took place at the Dog Beach, for example, uh, which is towards the top of that image, and also at Greenwood, which is in the, the lower portion, Greenwood and Dempster at the bottom of, of that image. Um, but interestingly, you know, some of the other beaches actually um, had, had much less impact. Um, but those two in particular, you can see how much uh, erosion took place um, as a result of the, those high lake levels. And what we saw during 2020, there was a couple of <coughs> quite significant storms, one in particular on January 11th. Um, we had flooding of Elliott Park. Um, the image on the right is at Garden Park. Um, we had a lot of water on the roadway at um, Sheridan Road. Uh, there were police out there um, managing traffic because it was dangerous to pass. Um, at, at Lee Street, uh, there was so much erosion that some old structures were uncovered um, and the water was almost all the way up to the, the walking path. Um, there is a video um, that I we, we have from that time from Clark Street, but it, it doesn't actually play, <laughs> I'm afraid, so I can't show it you, but um, uh, we'll move through. So um, in 2020, the city did a, um, produced a roadmap where there was a risk assessment of all of the public shoreline in, in Evanston. Um, and uh, it was a combination of the condition of the shoreline, uh, the vulnerability to storms, primarily the, the elevation, and then looking at how that those areas were used. Um, out of that ranking came a, um, a an initial estimate of what some of the capital improvement cost may be. And then, in fact, the city also moved ahead with some permanent repairs at, at three locations, uh, at Greenwood Beach, at Dempster, and at... Um, Garden Park, and then also some temporary um, flood protection that was installed at Elliott Park um, and at Dempster. Um, so this is just the before and after image um, of that protection at Greenwood, um, and then also at, um, at Garden Park and at um, Dempster Street. So the current project um, is looking now at eight of the highest risk areas that were not addressed with permanent repairs. Uh, and the goals are to look at long-term sustainable shoreline repair solutions, um, and if possible, to identify potential um, external funding um, that, that the city could take advantage of, for example, federal funds from FEMA and others. And also, um, to look at protecting and enhancing the recreational opportunities at the, the different parks. So within the current project, um, there's been uh, a lot of data collection. Um, we've done a um, fairly robust um, coastal engineering assessment looking at um, waves um, under different lake level conditions so that we know what the design parameters are. And there's also been um, a couple of uh, public engagements. So there was a survey, um, public opinion survey that went out, which we got about 1,300 responses from. And we've held one um, public open house last month. At that public open house, we shared out a lot of the results from the public opinion survey. We allowed people the opportunity to add comments, um, talk to members of the team, and to provide their own thoughts. We also had um, image boards with a variety of different types of shorelines um, for people to be able to respond to. People were given green or yellow. Green means, yeah, we kind of like the way that looks, and, um, and yellow was, yeah, not, not so much. Um, so what, where we are right now um, is working on, at each of those eight locations, some different concepts uh, that, that could that would take, it, um, take into account some of the, the response and the feedback that we've gotten and thinking about how some of these different um, areas could be addressed. Um, the schedule uh, for the balance of the project, um, right now uh, we're in this concept design phase. 
there are going to be um, uh, a couple more public engagements um, that will take place early next year, and then we will move into a, a preliminary engineering phase so that we can get um, some reliable cost estimates and carry out benefit cost analysis, which is necessary for the um, application for any federal funding. Um, and that would take place into next spring. So that's the schedule that we're working to. Um, so as I said, the, in the conceptual design phase, we're going to look at each one of these eight um, areas. We'll be, um, we'll be looking at not only traditional um, shoreline protection, but also whether there's some opportunity for a more nature-based uh, or green infrastructure type of, of, of arrangement. Um, and then, as I said, uh, as we move into the uh, preliminary engineering phase, um, we'll be refining the construction cost estimates um, so that we can provide the city with, uh, with, with realistic estimates of, of what the different um, options may cost. So I went through the slides pretty quickly. Um, I could talk about this topic for a long time, um, but I'm happy to take any questions if, if there are any. I know you have a lot of other business tonight also. so. I have a lot of questions out of my own personal curiosity. So in the interests of the public's time, I'll follow up with you separately later. Please do that. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Is this, could you share this with us? Yes. Staff has a copy of this presentation. It's posted on the APW uh, sheet. Okay. Not, I didn't see it in the Not council packet, but if you go to the Now it's board. there in the agenda for this evening. Okay, great. So I know there's been for us, a lot of residents have asked what's the difference between we have like shoreline restoration, shoreline um, repair, shoreline, um, there's, several, there's about four different, the roadmap. Um, can we get, find out what we've invested so far? And I'm not, this wouldn't be necessarily you, but staff going back to when we began this and um, and then the f I think there's a five-year projection, I think, um, also as to how, where this is going to go so that we have sort of a, an idea, the residents. I will email you the list of all the things. I actually prepared it, but it just didn't make it into the slide pre presentation. So I will send that to you. I would not get very hung up on the five-year budget. Staff put in a placeholder. When we put in numbers for the five-year budget, um, at best, we're putting an estimate on the total project cost. I find it hard to believe that unless there was a huge outcry from the city council that we would move forward without getting federal funding to cover the majority of the cost. So whatever numbers are in there are sort of just pretty wishy-washy at this point. I would wait until we get through the public engagement, we get more detailed cost estimates, and then we have a discussion about what really are the next steps before I get to interest in the five-year program for this. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments, discussion? Okay. Well, with that, I think our um, that brings to a close um, the APW meeting. And we have...